Hey, what's up guys? Today on this episode of Design Over Time, we are going to be looking at the game 2048. It's a free puzzle game that you can play online, and yes, I know this game was inspired by threes. Let me show you threes. So while this iOS game came first, uh, this game is inspired by it, and they share a lot of the same basic interactions, basic rules, so there's two interesting things that I want to talk to you guys about uh, that really make this game sort of unique. And I'm going to compare it to a couple other puzzle games, but before we get any further, I just want to jump right in and show you what the game looks like. Okay, so this is 2048. It's a game you play with the D-pad, as you can kind of see. Moving right, the tiles slide right, hit up, all the tiles slide up. And every time you hit a direction, another number spawns in and slides all the way down in the same direction that you pressed. So if I hit it right, you're going to see a 2, and it spawns in somewhere... Um, Actually, it spawns in somewhere in the middle of the field in one of the existing squares. So it doesn't necessarily have to slide all the way to the end. And then if I hit down, you know, another two appears. If I hit it right, nothing happens because if no panel can move, then you really don't have a valid move in that direction. And that kind of keeps things simple. And this is basically the game. You stack up numbers like these twos, and they create fours. And if you stack up the same number, they add up. They double, if you will. So fours become eights, and eights become sixteens, like this, fours, sixteens, and then when you can get the two sixteens together, like this, they become thirty-two, and put those together, sixty-four. So, uh, the whole challenge of this game is to get two hundred and forty-eight, or two thousand and forty-eight, that's the, um, for this particular iteration, that's the largest tile that you can create, and you're supposed to challenge yourself to move all the pieces on the board in such a way that you can build the necessary smaller numbers like this and then stack them up whenever they become um, available. So it's all about managing your space. It's all about understanding the pretty simple uh, respawn, the random respawn. You're either going to get a 2 or a 4 randomly spawning in, but you have to build basically all the numbers up from a 2s or 4s. So as you're moving pieces around the board, you have to be kind of conscious of where they're going and how they're moving like this I'm gonna put the 16s together like that and then I can put the 32s together like this and then I also put the 64 together so that's essentially how the game works uh, it's a lot of fun something interesting to do and I kind of want to talk about how this game works on a very basic level because as you're playing this game and as you're hitting directions your game board may look a lot like this where you have numbers all over the place and as you seek to uh, put them together like this you know, you have more or less success collapsing all the numbers into the right places. And sometimes you want to get a number from one area to the other, and you're going to have a hard time. Like right now, I'm doing a pretty good job. So it's not a really good example of what's difficult about this game. So let me mash the button a little bit and show you a little bit of what your game may look like. Okay, so here, pretty tricky situation. Uh, the 32s are not very close to each other, but if they did, you'd be able to create a 64 and then combine it with a 64. Uh, on the top area, we have some 2s, and the 2s need to combine, but every time we move it, we have to be conscious of what's going to spawn in on the other side. So if I move right, the top left corner is going to spawn in with something like this, and that's a 4. And if I move it down, it's a 2, and that turns into an 8 and up 16. And then I don't have a really good way of getting these 32s together. So, you know, all the actions you do in this game have a, have a little habit of rippling forward, and it's up to you to uh, understand how to move efficiently oops, and effectively so you don't get a game over. Um, so with that base, I want to jump into the wheel and show you exactly what two things I think are most interesting about this particular game's basic interactions, right? So, you know, as far as inputs go, it uses the D-pad, nothing too complicated as far as controls go. Um, and as far as your basic verbs go, we have move. And in this case, we're not moving any particular tile. We're moving the entire board. And of course, the board is 2D. You have two axes of uh, direction. So if we just go over here and look at dynamics, like I said before, 95%, 99% of all games use some kind of space as uh, their core dynamic. It kind of by default sets everything up into your game space and there are very few games that don't use space and this is just one that uses 2d space so it's pretty simple and straightforward uh like that and then you can move and every time you move you don't move tiles you actually move all the tiles at once and that is a dynamic that makes everything just a little bit more 
interesting, we'll, we'll say, because I didn't want to use the word dynamic twice in a row, but essentially you have one move command and it affects multiple things simultaneously, and that's exactly what this definition is uh, getting at, this idea that if you do one thing and it has multiple either cascading or um, simultaneous effects, right, that are triggered by that one action, then you can consider those interactions, those resulting states to be dynamic uh, fallout from that initial action. And that's a pretty simple way of understanding what makes this game tick. So if I could just move any tile that I wanted and not worry about the other tiles, I wouldn't have this issue where all of a sudden, just to get one thing to move in one direction I want, it comes at the sacrifice of just about everything else. Right, if I move this right and I want to move this two down, it's inevitably going to spawn another two. And even if I didn't want that there, uh, or even if I didn't want these eights to stack and these twos to stack, you're actually simultaneously moving so many things at once. And that's, that already sets the complexity a little bit higher than your, your average push block uh, puzzle game or your average basic movement for any other kind of video game. Uh, but the other interesting thing is... We have a random we have a random element. Let me see if I can find that. Properties, contact and collision, cancel, health, blah blah or heat, transformation, random, right here. So we all know what random means. You know, it's a rule that adds randomness to, to an element. The rule can be a property or a verb or whatever. Uh, it can deal with random spawn locations, any AI or whatever. In this particular case, we're talking about spawn locations. So these two rules together are really what make this game tick and I really love it how elegant a lot of puzzle games can be because with just a few rules just by defining a few simple elements they can get so much uh, interesting gameplay out of it and what in particular that makes this game interesting can be described as thus every move you make in 2048 cannot be undone and that's because of the random element I was describing before so even if you want to make a relatively simple move like this now a new element's in the board, and the board will never be the same again. Yeah, I think that's true. The board will never be the same again. Even if you collapse the twos, uh, the values of the other elements on the board are going to increase, and everything is constantly changing. So the, the introduction of new elements means that you can't just simply make a move and take it back. There are no takes back sees in this. So combined with the dynamic uh, sliding of the entire board, right, and now every time you move, something else gets a little bit more complicated. And it's complicated in a way that's not completely random. Like I said before, it spawns in a location that is um, someplace where the area is left, right? It's got to be a blank space. You can mitigate and control that a little bit. But for the most part, it's adding a lot of new factors to consider for the turns to come. So even as I'm playing now, just trying to keep track of it and trying to get an 8 on the top and then trying to get a 16 there, now this two is blocking it. So in order to get these 16s to line up, I might have to slide everything to the left. And then now there's a, a gap in the bottom right, but if I hit down, this two is gonna fill it out, so I probably need to back this two up, and so on and so forth, right? Like, nothing ever stays the same, and everything sort of cascades forward, or upward. Get a two in the top area, like this, turns into a four, turns into a 64, turns into an eight. So when the numbers are low, everything has sort of a habit of kind of sticking together nice and neatly like this. Even if I randomly hit the buttons, you can see the, the pieces are sliding together and there's a really high chance that they'll find something to match. But as the game progresses, this is gonna be less and less likely the case. You're gonna to need to make more and more um, conscious and careful decisions about where you put numbers. Two, four, eight, like this. Eight, 16, 32, 64, 128. So, that, that's kind of what's interesting about the game. But if we compare this to other games like this sliding block puzzle game, this is a game where it's not nearly as dynamic as 2048. This game, you move a panel, you click it, and there's only one space any panel can move. So, you know, if I don't want this watermelon to be right here, I can click it back down and no harm's done. Every single move you make in this game, even though it's 2D spatially oriented, um, can be taken back. So I can, you know, do this and then reverse it, no harm. 2048's random element prevents that from happening, so you're constantly moving forward. All right, so let me try to solve this real quick. One of the benefits for having a game where you can take back moves is that, you know, you can explore this space a little bit uh, more freely, right? You don't have to worry about if every click you're gonna make, will that result in a game over? You can take things back and 
even developed some simple algorithms for solving it, right? So this looks like this goes in the, the bottom left. So I need to get all these pieces bottom left. And, if, and since I can't move them directly, I have to think very indirectly about how to get them there. Right, and then these pieces are lined up, but none of the other pieces are. So I have to figure out how to get this piece in the corner. And then once that piece is lined up, it kind of makes the whole thing fit into place, right? So there's, there's really cool things that happen. Um, in this game, you're limited to sp uh, in the kind of space you can move around, which should be the case on all these puzzle games. But what's interesting is um, you'll work out some algorithms to get pieces in the places you want without disturbing the other pieces. In a very simple way, this is how Rubik's Cubes also work, right? This is a 3D puzzle, and every time you rotate a face or a column, you're technically rotating all the other faces at once and all the other sort of uh, relative positions of the colors. So even though this cube right now is solved, let me see if I can... So you can just do this, and even though it looks kind of crazy now, you can always reverse your actions, oops, and realign things. And that gives Rubik's Cubes a really neat sort of similar uh, a logarithmic solvability and people figure out all kinds of algorithms to move exactly what they want and, th and that's the basic way that you approach this the Rubik's Cube is much more complex uh, siding block puzzle you can see is similar kinds of things but it's much simpler and then we go back to 2048 so it's pretty obvious that there's there's a strategy to this game as with sort of all structurally sound sort of enclosed spaces and math based games like this and it doesn't take very long to go into the internet and be like okay you see a lot of these kinds of pictures. And these kind of pictures are suggesting a certain kind of way of stacking your pieces, a certain way of progressing that allows you to minimize random risk, the random elements, and have all the numbers flowing in a particular direction so that they stack up nicely. You'll see lots of pictures like this all over the internet, like what to do from given positions and how to stack things up. And there's YouTube videos all over the place saying how to play 2048. But what I think that's really interesting to consider is that all this complexity, all these algorithms, all these tips and tricks, uh, the reason why it's so hard to get a tile where you want to in this case comes from those three game elements interacting in basically two dynamics, right? One random element that comes in, um, shifting all the pieces on the board at once and having some space to shift pieces in the first place. So. So one thing to consider whenever you're talking about any video game, it doesn't necessarily have to be a puzzle game. It can be, it can be a combat game, it can be a puzzle game, it can be sort of a strategy game, whatever. Uh, how dynamic are your basic inputs, your basic player mechanics, your basic actions? And, you know, it only takes a few dynamics in the right places in order to create a very sort of complex and rich landscape. It only takes a touch of randomness in order to get the full effect of having an unpredictable yet somewhat manageable uh, play space. You know, just a little randomness in the right area is the mark of, an, of, a, of a competent designer, right? I think there's a lot of potential for designing games, uh, action games with mechanics that are more like this, where you are doing multiple things simultaneously and doing, you know, less actions per second per minute, but having all those actions sort of be richly defined as doing multiple things at once. That's an idea we'll explore later, so don't worry about that. Uh, you can leave a comment or a question down below and feel free to subscribe to us or follow us on Twitter. Our Twitter is at Design Oriented and I'm Kirby Kid. I go by at Kirby Kid on Twitter. So until the next episode of Design Over Time, I will see you next time. I need a better phrase than that. <laughs> <laughs>